Oh, thank you. All right, so how close does that match what you guys are doing when you make your prototypes for your projects? Pretty close? Look pretty similar? Look familiar? So today we're talking about design output development and design for manufacturability. Now I'll talk a little bit about several things in here, but these are going to be really high level views of some things that are course long, lifelong learning topics. So what I'm really trying to do is just introduce you to some terminology, give you some ideas of what would happen in a world where you guys don't just make a prototype and deliver it, but you're building uh, you know, manufacturable scales. So I grab Scantron. Um, so high level answer one, two, how do I communicate my design so that it can be manufactured? Okay. So you guys tend to build your own project here in Epix. Um, when you get into your jobs someday, if you work in industry, you're probably not going to build every one of them. If you were the guy that invented Lego, you wouldn't be making those 14,000 boxes an hour by yourself, right? How are things made? How are, what are some manufacturing methods? Um, how can I make sure my part was made correctly? So we'll talk about inspection and quality just a little bit. And then how does design affect cost? So again, we're just looking at kind of broad concepts, just trying to give you a, a shallow introduction to these things. Um, but it may help you a little bit when you go to apply for jobs after you leave here. Because those of you who are in the engineering fields, you call yourself a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer, and you won't see those job titles in industry. Nobody hires a mechanical engineer. They hire a development engineer, or a quality engineer, or a manufacturing engineer. So knowing what that means might help you to decide if that's something you'd be interested in doing. So we'll start with a recap because I talk about this couple of topics every semester because we don't do them well. Um, so the design process, can somebody tell me the, the steps or the phases of the design process? Oops, Scantron. Matt? What are the steps of the design process? Project identification. Project identification. Well, we say specification development, but that includes user needs, right? Right, conceptual design, detailed design. Testing. Well, we say delivery, yeah. right? So that, that's right, that's the Epic design process. It's a user-centered design process. So you engage your user at each stage, very good. Can somebody tell me what a user need is? So he mentioned user needs. 
So somebody, guys in the back, what's a user need? Right, basic features of your product, right? So if you're designing a car, it should accelerate, decelerate, hold passengers, steer. These are the user needs. What's the specification? Somebody over here, specification. I know this isn't the first of my lectures you've been in. We've talked about this every time. What's the specification? Measurements. Right, like measurements. So it's t taking those user needs and making them quantifiable, right? <clears throat> so a good specification would be something that you can test, right? You can get a yes or no answer to whether or not you've achieved it. They should be complete. They should not be conflicting. So there should be a solution that's possible in the space, right? So those are some, some things about specifications. Those are important to us as we talk about design outputs because you design to your set of specifications, which are dependent on your user needs, okay? So as you're designing to those things and generating design outputs, you need to make sure when you get into the testing phase that your outputs meet your inputs. So make sure your outputs meet all those specifications. So if we look at the design process, in EPICS we do project identification. So you might make a project chart or you talk about what the project is, you can say who we're doing it for, why it's important, what, what are we doing, what's the big idea. Even though you don't have any design yet, you're just figuring out what's the problem, right? And then we go through specification development, and that's when you build out all those, those measurable things, right? So it's going to be less than three pounds, it's going to cost less than $30, those types of things. And then as we get into conceptual design, this is where you guys spend really almost all of your time in EPICS. So you go through and come up with an idea, and you make a quick and dirty prototype of that idea, and you try to deliver it, and they say, nope, this isn't a product, this is an early prototype, and you try again, and you try again, until you get to something that you really like. And then you guys usually call that detailed design, and you deliver it, right? So we go from detailed design to delivery. What we'll talk about today is what real thorough detailed design is like. Most of us skip that because we're delivering a prototype. We're not doing manufacturing. But in industry, you're going to have production in between detailed design and delivery, right? So if you were making Legos and you did detailed design, and you came up with a bunch of prints and routings and manufacturing orders, you have to actually make those parts to deliver them, right? So that's a key piece. So production is something we don't cover in Epics very much, but I wanted to give you some um, idea how it works. So what design outputs are, they just specify what the design is, okay? So the actual design is something that happens sort of in your mind, right? I have this problem. I need a machine that will transport me about. I come up with this idea for a car, and that all happens in your head kind of spontaneously as you work through, you iterate it. But the design outputs are how you document and communicate that to someone else. There are a number of things that um, we use to communicate a design. Uh, the first one that we'll talk about today are prints or schematics. So I come from a biomedical engineering background, mostly mechanical. So most of this will have a mechanical flavor to it. So if you're a chemical engineer or electrical engineer, you'll have to bear with me a little bit. Um, so you'll have a print of a part, and that specifies what the geometry of the part is. The next thing you'll have are routings. So routings tell you how, uh, what the steps are in making a part and what kind of machines you'd use to make them. Um, hi, you're a little bit late. Um, so uh, the next is a bill of materials. So a bill of materials will tell you what parts you need, right? what things go into your design. The next one, labels and names. You might not think are important what labels and names are, but in industry these become very important. So I come from a medical device field. Your labeling and your names, you take a lot of time to go into those because you have to get them cleared through regulatory bodies. But if you're in any industry, you're going to want to trademark your name. You're going to want to have you know, that little registered symbol next to it so other people can't use it. You'll put a lot of time and effort into that. You'll have a manual, so something to tell the user how to do it. Um, depending on what you're doing, you might have training for your users. 
Um, you'll have inspection criteria. So this is what we'll talk about. How do you know that the part you made was good? How do you know that Lego you made will stick to all of the other Legos? So some kid pulls it out of the box, wants to stick it to the box of Legos he bought three years ago. They better go together, okay? And then testing results. So you're going to want to maintain all those. So all of these kind of documents go into what's called a device master record. And so when you are creating whatever your product is in industry, you will create a device master record that will contain all of these things. So you could hand it to someone and say, make my part, and they can make it for you, okay? <clears throat> so the first one uh, we'll talk about in a, a decent bit of detail are prints. And I'm going to go through an example um, set of prints. There's a few mistakes in here uh, when I made this that I'll point out to you. Hopefully some of you will catch them for me. Um, but um, I think a lot of us get to here, right? So we, we get to a model, and then you send it to the Epix TAs, and they print it for you and give it back to you, and you say, I'm done. All right. That won't typically cut it. Um, that's great for what we do. So if you can get to this point of having a model, hopefully all of your sketches are fully constrained if you're doing any CAD work. Uh, if not, and you don't know what that means, if you're doing CAD work and you don't know what fully constrained means, come talk to me. I'll help you. Um, or take a class in CAD. That would help. Uh, I never had a formal cl uh, class in CAD, and I did nothing but making CAD models in my um, career. So you don't have to have a class to do it, but it helps. So what we have here is an assembly, a very simplified version of a slap hammer. So a slap hammer is a tool that we use in orthopedics for removing devices. So say I've put a femoral prosthetic on your legs, so your femur is your thigh bone. So on the end of your thigh bone, and it's cemented in, and I want to get it back out. That's difficult to do. So you can attach the end of this to that. The teal piece is a heavy handle, and you can slide it along the shaft. When it hits the orange stop at the end, pops the device off, okay? Uh, knee surgery is pretty violent, so <laughs> that's one of the tools that we use. Um, so I designed a number of these. This is a super simplified version that wouldn't work very well at all, but it gives you the idea of how an assembly could go together. So that green pin is holding the teal shaft onto the, or the teal handle onto the orange shaft, right? So it can slide, but it can't come off. Does that make sense to everybody? See how it works? Yes? Okay, good. It's a pretty simple tool. <clears throat> so when you create that model, you then want to create a print. How many of you have made a print before? A couple of you. Okay, good. Good. Not, not too few. Um, so I want to point out a few things on a print. So usually you have a template, which is this stuff that goes around the print. Okay? And there, there are a number of things in there that are important. So one, it's hard to see in here, but there are numbers along the side and letters across the top and bottom. And the purpose of those are when this print becomes a really complex part and you have 400 dimensions on this piece of paper and you send this to a shop to be made and they say, I have a question about you know, the radius on the handle, but you, if you have 200 different dimensions on there, you might not be able to tell what they're talking about. So being able to say, I want to know about this diameter in F7 helps a lot in communication. Okay? Seems like a simple thing, but it is important. Um, a few other things to notice here, you have, you have a title block down here in the bottom corner. <coughs> It'll tell you things like who made this part, who worked on it. So who was the engineer, who was the drafts person, things like that. Um, and if you don't know, a drafts person is people who make prints. Um, it'll tell you the, both the name of the assembly and uh, the name of the part. It'll tell you the size of the print paper, the revision of the part, <coughs> which is very important. So as you go through and change a part, you can have a revision history. So you can tell version H from version G, and people will know what you're doing. So if you make changes that, can, that change what things it's compatible with, you'll know. So it's very important. Um, down here in the bottom left, we have a set of notes. And then we have several views of the part. So this is that handle put in 2D. So the first view is called, is called a base view. Okay? And so the base view is whatever direction you set it as, <coughs> the other views are going to be turning that part along the paper to give you the different views. Okay, so that's the, the first view you look. So here I used this front view along the axis as the base view. And you'll notice a couple of things. One, this symbol right here, a little bit hard to see, is for, to indicate a diameter. So you know that I'm looking at the diameter across this circle. 
Uh, and I have diameters in both of these. And then you'll notice there are a couple of numbers beside it. And those are the tolerances, okay, so an upper tolerance and a lower tolerance. So the upper tolerance tells you how much bigger the part can get than the dimension that you have written. And the lower tolerance tells you how much smaller. And those become very, very important when you have... Um, are there like industry standards like that go along with making prints? <coughs> so most, most, or most businesses have their own templates um, and they're very similar. Um, so that outside part is called a pattern. Uh, most will have a pattern. Um, but yeah, I would say in general, most places do it the same. I don't know that there are written standards. We don't. Nope. Uh, very few projects get far enough to doing a print with tolerances on them. Um, usually, like I say, you make a prototype, you tweak it until it works, and you deliver it, because we don't make more than one most of the time. Um, but very rarely in industry will you make one. All right. Uh, so if I, take that, if I take that view and I turn it down, then you can now look along the side of the part. And a couple of things to notice here. One, here's a, a dimension for the length, which I specify as 100. So there's no tolerance here. So that was a mistake. Um, oftentimes, you'll see in the title block a default tolerance. So they'll say, if I don't put anything there, here's what the tolerance should be. I didn't do that in this case. So this is, this is impossible to make. Okay, So this would be saying this has to be exactly 100 which you can't do, okay? So as long as you have a precise enough measuring device, you can never make something to a perfect dimension. That's why we specify a tolerance band, okay? And depending on what you're making, you may not care, um, you know, within any kind of tight range. If it's something that has to interact like a part in the inside of your engine that has to be precision, um, you'll have very, very tight tolerances. Or if you do like a valve or a seal, very tight tolerances. So, um, it does become very important. So there's the, the first mistake for you to notice. Um, and then the second one is here. So um, on this view, uh, I show you the slot. And I have the, the length of the slot and the radius of the end, which would give you the width of the slot. But I don't specify where this slot is along the part. So if you sent this off to be made and they made it right in the middle, you wouldn't have much grounds to complain that they did it wrong because you didn't say where it should be. So I should have some dimension off one of the ends to tell you where that should be, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So then the other thing back in this view to notice is this dashed line down the middle with an A and an arrow. There's actually one at the top too, but it's being cut off now. This is to indicate a section view named AA. And the section view is if you cut into the paper through that part and you look from the direction of the arrow, okay? So I'm saying I'm going to cut through it, and that's what this view right here is. So I've cut through the part, and I've opened it up, and I'm looking from that side. So now I can see the slot where you see the hash marks is what would be solid where you cut. Okay. So I cut through the material right along these hash marks. Um, and it lets you see things that are internal to the part that are hard to see from just the external view. So here you can see the chamfer. Uh, I've got a, a lead-in chamfer that's a millimeter by 45. So those are some of the kind of basic things in creating a print for an individual part. Does everybody kind of follow that? And so if you send this to any machine shop, they could make that part that you specified, okay? Um, so here's our title blocks. You can see it just a little bit better. So you can see I, I called my assembly handle example, and this is the drawing for a handle. There's a revision number. Um, you also see things like the scale. So I, I set this print as a one-to-one -one scale, but you'll notice in each view, I actually have a two to one scale. So the, the more appropriate way to do that would have been to set the scale two to one here. Um, but you can set scales for individual views as well. Like if you have something that you want to show in a detail, you could do a 10 to one scale um, or whatever, whatever you like, depending on the size of your part. Um, the other thing to notice back in the note block down here, this is where you can communicate things that are not geometric. Okay? So I, here I say this material is a 17-4 stainless steel. So just looking at the geometry, you wouldn't know what this part should be made of. Um, I can specify surface treatments. Like I say, heat treat this to a Rockwell 40 minimum. So this is a way to tell uh, a chemical processing or a, a heat processing in the, to this part. And then I say a fine ceramic, then glass bead blast finish. So this is just a type of surface finish. Um, they pelt it with beads, and that gives you kind of a matte finish. 
on the part. So things like that that you can't see in the dimensions, you can specify uh, here in the print. Now, it seems like kind of a mundane detail, but when you, especially if you're a development engineer, um, this is your way to control your finished product, okay? So you're gonna spend a lot of time and work designing your part, whatever your project is, to work just perfect the way you want it, how you've tested it. And if you send that off to have people manufacture it and they don't make it the way that you wanted it, um, that causes a lot of trouble. So here, this is your way to control things. Right? You can hold people accountable to not following your print. So um, development engineers will become very protective of their prints and put a lot of work into these, and rightfully so. Um, so let me skip through these. Um, so here's another print. So I, I, I'm not going to walk you through the other parts, but I do want to show you an assembly print. So an assembly print is not an individual part, but it's how the parts go together. So it looks very similar, but there are a few differences to notice. The first one is a bill of materials. So this will usually be in the top left corner, and it will tell you what things go into this particular assembly. Okay? So it's not the overall bill of materials for your project, but it is for this particular assembly. So I'll say I have one handle, one shaft, and one pen, and I'll sign them a part number and specify what revision of those parts go into this assembly. And then in your notes, uh, a little bit different. So, so here I did do a good job of specifying a default tolerance. Um, a lot of times this is in the title block, but it can be in the notes as well. And then I'm gonna give instructions on how to assemble this. So I'm gonna say insert item two, and in the bill of materials I have those numbered, insert item two uh, into item one as shown. So what this is telling you to do is to insert the shaft through the handle. And then I say press fit the pin through the handle into the shaft so that the shaft cannot come, or that the handle cannot come off, okay? So you can use basic English with this. You don't need to um, use legalese, but this is how you instruct people on putting this together the right way. And a lot of times it's not trivial. So if you have a large assembly, you'll have a lot of instructions. Um, and these can even go in an additional instruction, but it's, it's uh, good practice to put them right on your print. Um, and then you can specify function, like item two should slide freely within item one. So if they've pinned it and it is ground or it binds, they know that they need to fix something, okay? Um, so you'll, you'll see the similar kind of views. So here I still have my base view that I've rotated in each direction so you can see how the assembly goes together. And also the um, a section view still so you can see how the pin is assembled through. Does that make sense to everybody? Kind of assembly print? Good. Um, covered all those. So what I want to talk about now is how do you make sure that those parts go together correctly? So we talked about that you put a tolerance on there, but where do, you, where do those tolerances come from, right? How do you make sure that those Legos stick together properly? And you do it by doing a tolerance analysis. So um, though I'm going to walk you through a method, this, uh, a worst case tolerance stack up. So this is, you go through the order of assembly. So read through those assembly notes. And each step where something goes together, you're going to check all of the dimensions that need to go together and set the um, tolerances. We'll talk a little bit about maximum and minimum, or maximum and least material conditions. Um, and this is a really simple way of doing these. It's used a lot, but it's going to throw away the most parts. So you're using basic geometry to set. There are absolutely zero cases where these things could interfere. Okay? So you're only going to accept parts where they can't interfere. In a lot of industries, you can use statistical control where you can say, I want 99.99% of parts to go together because you're not that concerned. I come from a medical device field. If you have one in a thousand or one in 10,000 cardiac pacemakers not go together correctly, that'll be trouble, right? So um, those things where they need to go in, uh, they're gonna be assembled in the use environment, you really wanna make sure they're going together. If they're gonna be assembled in your factory and you can check them and throw away the bad ones, then it's less of a big deal. Um, so those are a couple of things. But uh, some more refined methods. Uh, GDT is geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. So instead of calling a dimension um, one inch, you can you can specify some more details. That's a course of its own. Um, 
I just want you to know that there are some other methods. So GD&T is one of those. So GD&T, for example, instead of on a cylinder, instead of giving it a diameter, you give it a set of cylinders that it has to reside within. So you, it's a bit confusing to teach without any um, visual aids, but it's just an, another method for doing tolerancing. Another one is statistical tolerancing. So this is where you go and say, I'm going to let there be possibilities where these two parts don't go together, but I think it's going to be small enough that it's negligible. Okay. So we won't, we won't go into those. Um, those are a bit more advanced. I just want you to be aware of them. Um, so uh, I'll talk about these couple of concepts, but if we look at um, uh, this assembly, and the first step was to insert the shaft inside the handle, right? And let's say this is um, 10 millimeters. Is that big enough for you guys to see back there? And let's call this um, 10 and a half, okay? So those are gonna be my nominal dimensions. So I'm gonna say nominally, uh, this is gonna be a 10 millimeter shaft going into a 10 and a half millimeter hole. So I've got half a millimeter default slot between these two parts. Does that make sense to everybody? But I want to assign my tolerance values. So I'm going to say this could be 10 millimeters plus shaft upper or minus shaft lower. So this is going to be my upper tolerance and my lower tolerance. So I'm going to say I can add SU or I can subtract SL and I'm still going to accept this part. Does everybody understand that concept? Same thing here. So for my whole, I'm going to say this is plus my whole upper tolerance or minus my whole lower tolerance, okay? Now, I have a couple of conditions to consider. My nominal condition is what I've specified in my part. So that's the half a millimeter difference. Maximum material condition is when I let everything be as big as it can be. And what I'm looking for here is interference, okay? If I, if I let my shaft be as big as I'm going to allow it and the hole be as small as I'm going to allow it, will it still fit? Least material condition is the opposite. That's when everything is as small as it can be. So I'm just checking the boundary conditions, right? So as small as it can be, how much slop am I going to allow in those parts? And that can become very important as well. I'd say the maximum material condition is always critical to check because you never want part interference or it won't, your assembly won't go together. If it's not a critical case and you don't really care how sloppy it is, your least material condition might not be that important to you, okay? But we'll, we'll look first um, at, at maximum material condition. I want, my, um, I want my hole or my shaft to be as large as it can be. So I want my 10 millimeters plus my upper tolerance to be still less than or equal to my hole at its smallest state. So my 10.5 minus my lower tolerance of my hole. Okay, is everybody following that? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so if I do the algebra across here, then I know I want SU um, plus HL, if I can draw, um, to be equal to 0.5 millimeters, okay, in the worst case. So I can forget about the less than because I'm looking at only at the boundary case. So this is where I have one equation and two variables, right? So if you were in math class, you would say, I give up, and you'd move on. But you're an engineer, so you get to choose. You can assign these values. And I know from experience that when I go to drill a hole, I can hold my tolerance a lot tighter than when I go to put this on a lathe and cut it, OK? So I'm going to say my, my hole I can hold really tight. So I'm going to set my, my hole tolerance to 0, OK? So I'm not going to let that hole get any bigger than 10 and a half. So now this becomes easy, and I know that um, my shaft upper, I can let be as big as 0.5 millimeters. Does that make sense to everybody? So now if I go into my worst case and I say, you've made my shaft 10 and a half millimeters, and you've made my hole at its worst case of 10 and a half millimeters, it's line to line and it'll still assemble. Okay? So that's the worst that you can allow it to be. Now at the least material condition, 